So we just finished our unit on special relativity. For the remainder of the year, we're not going to be going near the speed of light. So you can assume time is the same for two objects. You can assume masses aren't changing. We're not going to be delving into that anymore. We're going to be doing what we call Newtonian physics, physics, named after Sir Isaac Newton. What we've looked at actually is called kinematics. Kinematics was displacement, velocity, time, acceleration. It was VF equals VI plus AT. It was VF squared equals VI squared plus 2AD. Just realize you're not seeing the screen yet because the, uh, let's do that. That was kinematics. Kinematics is the study of how things move. We're now going to look at dynamic forces. Dynamics forces is the study of why things move or don't move. So what's a force? I'm going to give you a bad definition, but it'll work for physics 11 and 12. I'm going to tell you that a force is a push or a pull. If you're pushing on something or you're pulling on something, that's a force. A physicist would be cringing at that definition. A force is an interaction between two objects when they exchange both. I, I, I get that. We're going to just stay at the higher level and not dive down to the quantum level all the time. Is force a vector or a scalar? It is very, very much a vector. And I can prove it to you. Let me just pause the video for a second. Good letter to use for f force. What would be a good letter to use an abri for f force? We use a capital F. Lowercase f is frequency, capital F is force. The units, force is measured in Newtons. We named it after Sir Isaac Newton, one of the greats. I'll go on an Isaac Newton rant in a little bit. The symbol, capital N. One of the things we're going to talk about very often is the net force. What's the net force? That is the total, the sum of all the forces. So let me give you an example here. It says find the net force in the following diagrams, and I'm going to say magnitude and direction. Uh, let's use a direction of uh, north. South, uh, change colors, Mr. Duick, so it stands out. Can you all draw a little compass rose right here above the letter A like that? Okay. If we push with seven newtons, I guess, east and two newtons east, if I combine that into one force, what's that the same as? A single force, how big? Be obvious. Seven newtons, direction? East. So we would say F net was 7 newtons. And then to show it's a direction, we use an at symbol or we use square brackets east. By the way, we're going to run into a problem because this N right here will be newtons. But if the capital N is after the at symbol, that's north. Have I mentioned we don't have enough letters in the English? I, I hope I've mentioned occasionally that we really could use more letters in our English alphabet, right? Because we are just don't have enough. So you have to always look at the context. Hey, Braden, what do you think the net force is here? Three, direction. South? Did you draw the compass rows like I told you to draw the compass rows so you wouldn't have to think about it? Huh? Okay. Three newtons east. I'm not going to be that fussy about direction for most of the unit, but in this particular example, I think we kind of need to be. We could have said left or right by that, for that matter. Ooh. Okay. Paige, what do you think the net force is here? Loud and proud, you're right. Zero. This is a hugely important situation. If you know the net force on an object is zero, you can make a whole bunch of other assumptions and we'll, we'll get there, Scott. But that's one of those ding, ding, ding. Oh, the net force is zero. I now know a lot. And zero Newton, since there's no force, I'm not going to put any direction. It has no direction, much like your few. Anyways, it has no direction.
او six east and three north what's the net force there In physics 12, I will revisit the kinematics unit, V equals VIT plus a half AT squared. And I will revisit this unit, but if you talk to your grade 12 friends, it's going to be in two dimensions. We call this vector mathematics, and you'll learn that there are rules for adding east plus south, or east plus north, or west plus south. This year, everything's going to be in the nice straight dirt line. The most you'll have to do is do what Braden did instinctively. Braden, you let one way be positive and one way be negative, and you just said, oh, it's 5 plus negative 2, although I'm willing to bet you actually just went 5 minus 2. You didn't even go 5 plus negative 2. Am I correct? That's what we'll deal with this year. Okay, That's the most we'll bring in. I gotta go on my Sir Isaac Newton rant. I'm gonna pause the video. Sorry for those of you watching on YouTube. Isaac Newton came along and said, Cohen, I can explain how everything in the universe moves with three rules. I'm not going to make you memorize which one is Newton's first, which one is Newton's second, and which one is Newton's third. You can, but you will need to know what they are in that you will need to be able to explain them in English. Oh, and if you're lazy and you have memorized which one is Newton's first, second, and third, in your explanation, you can just say, because of Newton's first, and I'll get it, and I'm good with that. But you might, if you can't remember, ah, oh, was that Newton's first or second or third, you can, in your explanation, just explain the law. So what's Newton's first law? It's called the law of inertia. Here's what it says. If all the forces on an object are balanced, or the fancy phrase, the net force is zero. Oh, page, like uh, example C. Okay. If you know that all the forces are balanced, if the net force is zero, an object will either remain at rest, if it's already at rest, or move in a straight line at a steady speed. Uh, fancy phrase, if the net force is zero, a is zero. You can take that to the bank. And the only way, the only way an object can't be accelerating, the only way it can have an A of zero, two ways. If it's stopped, it's still stopped. Or if it was moving, it's moving on a straight line on a steady speed. So when you saw me roll that ball on the floor and it came to a stop, a could, uh, the net force could not have been zero because it slowed down and came to a stop. There had to have been an unbalanced force acting on it has to be. Uh, this rule also works in reverse. Not only if the forces are balanced, it's not accelerating, or if it's not accelerating, the net force is zero, the forces are balanced. If it is accelerating, changing its speed or its direction, or both, then there must be an unbalanced force acting on the object. The net force cannot be zero. I'd like you to imagine you're a passenger in a car. You're sitting in the right front seat. And the driver makes a sudden left turn. What sensation do you feel? Now, you might think, oh, I'm getting pushed to the right. You might feel like you're getting pushed outwards of the turn. That's not what's happening. In fact, Jada, Newton's first law is kicking in. Your body was going north in a straight line at a steady speed. It wants to keep going north in a straight line at a steady speed. The car moves into you, and the door is actually applying a force on you, pushing you around the corner. Now, you're not used to an inanimate object applying a force on you, so you think, oh, I'm getting pushed against the door. No, 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 you're not. The door is pushing on you has to be. How do I know? Because your direction is changing. So because your direction is changing, you must be accelerating. And Ella, if you're accelerating, there's got to be an unbalanced force acting on you. Newton's first. So I wrote here, contrary to what your common sense might tell you, you're not being pushed to the right at all. The driver steers the car to the left, but your body wants to keep going in a straight line on a steady speed. Newton's first.
but the door of the car is moving left with the rest of the car. You feel like you're getting pushed against the door by a force, but actually your body is trying to continue along its original path while the car is turning left. I don't know if you remember, I told you your bodies can detect acceleration, but they are backwards accelerometers, not forwards accelerometers. That's why, right there, you're getting pushed inwards by the door, but you feel like you're getting pushed outwards because you're not used to an inanimate object pushing you. Turn the page. I'm going to need to repeat this a bunch. I'm going to need to repeat this a bunch. You're going to find that I repeat this in different ways. There are probably different ways that I repeat this. See, I did that. As a rule, any object tends to continue moving with whatever speed and direction it has. Speed and direction? Velocity. Oh, this can ex include zero. If it's at rest, it's going to stay at rest. When your driver accelerates the car, your body tends to stay where it was, and you feel as though you're getting pushed back in the seat. So imagine you're sitting in the car and you're at rest. Your body wants to stay at rest. The car accelerates forwards. So if you're going to accelerate forward, a force has to push you forwards. That's the seat. But because you're not used to an inanimate object pushing on you, you're not used to an inanimate object pushing on you, you think you're getting pushed backwards. No, no, no. It's the seat pushing you forwards. Do you see? Okay. This is why your body is a backwards accelerometer. This tendency that all objects with mass have to resist changes in their states of motion is given a special name. We call it inertia. What is inertia? It's something that all objects with mass possess. It's that thing which resists a force. More inertia, it's more force resistant. You have to push harder. Less inertia, you don't have to push as hard. Every object in the universe that has mass has inertia. I have a friend who likes to say, you can think of inertia as a measure of the stubbornness of an object or its resistance to change. More inertia means it's less willing to change its motion state. So, what do you think? What has more inertia, a bicycle or a fully loaded logging truck? Be obvious. Okay? Because the logging truck has so much more inertia, it's more difficult to get moving and more difficult to stop once it starts moving and more difficult to turn at a corner. It resists it change to its motion state. So how do we measure inertia? Mass. I just lied. That's only true as long as you're not going near the speed of light. Remember in the last unit we learned that mass increases as you speed up? I fibbed. What I should have said was inertia increases. We call it your inertial mass. That increases as you speed up. But we're going to, for this unit, not be going anywhere near the speed of light. So for this unit, we're going to pretend mass stays constant. Inertia, or mass, I'm going to use them interchangeably, even though they're technically not, resists a force. You can think of mass as a measure of the stubbornness of an object, like inertia. The more mass an object has, the less willing it is to change its motion state. So, this is why our bodies are backwards accelerometers. Our bodies don't detect acceleration. Instead, we feel our own inertia, our own resistance to a force. I wrote here, car accident story. I've been in three car accidents in my life, and each one had some really good physics. The first one, I got rear-ended by a semi-truck on the freeway. And yeah, it hurt. We weren't going crazy fast. If you know the freeway, I was heading westbound. It was just before the Burnett exit. I was on my way to SFU. It was rush hour in the morning. It was stop-and-go traffic. 
and three cars in front of me, somebody had to hit the brakes really quick. So two cars in front of me, someone had to hit the brakes really, really quick. So one car in front of me, someone had to hit the brakes really, really, really quick. I had to slam on the brakes and the semi truck behind me, he had just looked down to grab his coffee mug for a sip. And by the time he looked up, boom, he was into me and my trunk was in my back seat. And here's what happened. I was driving a 1982 Honda. It was so old that it still had a cigarette lighter and ashtrays. They don't make those very often anymore. Had no cup holders. And so back then, this was in 19, what was this, 1996, we still made pennies. And so typically what you did is your ashtray was full of coins, mostly pennies. And pennies, when you have a hundred or 150 pennies in there, they have a fair bit of inertia, a fair bit of mass. When I got rear-ended, my ashtray shot out over my shoulder and hit the back seat. No, that's not what happened, Mallory. When I got rear-ended, my car got pushed forwards, but my ashtray had so much mass that it remained at rest as my car moved forward. And so it looked like it shot backwards and hit the back seat. Actually, no, my car got forced forwards. The ashtray just stayed where it was and ended up where my back seat now was. So it was a cool accident in terms of the physics. And I was okay. Oh, there's a great trick, a magic trick that involves using inertia. Pause. Oh, this is a, a nice one as well. This video is a nice example of inertia. It involves uh, shopping carts. Where is it? There we go. So these shopping carts have a lot of mass. They have a lot of inertia. Are they moving right now or are they at rest? They would like to remain at rest. Wait for it. Wait for it. As I said, they would like to remain at rest. The force between their wheels and the truck was not enough to get them to move forward. That's not my favorite part. My favorite part of the video was just about to come up. It's right there. This fella right here. Zaina, you're at the front. Can you see the timestamp on the video? What time is it? 757 57 a.m. I'll bet you coffee break is at 8 a.m. This guy is looking at the clock and thinking to himself, can I take my coffee break or my lunch break three minutes early? Because I don't want to be picking this up. Look at that. That is absolutely what's running through his mind right now. Right? He's, oh, can I bail on everybody? I don't want to clean this up. But also a good example of Newton's first law, the law of inertia. If an object's at rest, you need to apply a good force to get it to start to accelerate. Oh, subway sleeper. The subway is moving to your left. Okay. Explain that in terms of physics. Well, his body was slowing down, but his head, which is one of the larger parts of your body, has the most, some of the most mass, wanted to keep going in a straight line at a steady speed. Now, why didn't his body move? Well, there was enough friction between his pants and the seat that he was sitting on that could bring his body to a stop, but there was nothing applying a force to his head. His head kept going in a straight line at a steady speed. You've all kind of experienced that, not to that degree, but if you've fallen asleep in a car, you may wonder, why do I often wake up right when we go around a corner or when we're coming off of the freeway? It's because suddenly your body has detected a weird imbalance between the inertia and forces on your head and on your body, and it knows enough that that usually means something's bad, wake up. Oh, Space Station Reboost, this is a great one. Here we are at the International Space Station. We're doing a reboost we right now, and we're showing that the space station is actually accelerating away from us. Actually accelerating away from us. So let me back give you the backstory. Every so often, the space station has to boost itself up because although it's in space, 
it's close enough to the Earth. It's not a complete vacuum. It's a near vacuum, but it's scraping tiny amounts of atmosphere, which do slow it down over time. So every so often, we got to boost it up. Now, the rockets are pointing backwards, so the acceleration is out of the screen towards us. The astronauts are at rest. What they're going to do is they're going to lift their feet up, so they're floating, and you're going to see it's going to look like they're moving backwards. Actually, they're staying at rest. The camera is accelerating away We're from them. In the middle of the cabin. With us, watch. And it started We're already. In the middle of the cabin. And it started already. We start off, stop, in front of the camera. We start off, stop, in front of the camera. And you can see. And we get moved. And you can see space station is accelerating, leaving And us if you behind. watch close, you can also see they are speeding up. They're not just moving, they're accelerating. They're speeding up. Wow. 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 That's amazing. I'll do it again. That's amazing. I'll do it again. It's floating still. Floating still. Oh. Oh. Wow. 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 Sometimes the science is so cool that all you got is a wow. Actually, this astronaut's one of my favorites. If you take physics 12, I'll show you a really cool thing that he did when he was on the International Space Station, which if any of us had thought of it, oh, of course we would have done that at least once in zero-g. But that's a Physics 12 teaser. Oh, I have inertia beads. Got to pause the video here. So what's the short version of Newton's first? If an object is accelerating, there must be an unbalanced force on the object. Or, Ella, it also works completely in reverse. If there's an unbalanced force acting on an object, the object must be accelerating. If it's not accelerating and you don't have and you have unbalanced forces, you're missing a force. You must be. It's balanced. Uh, remember though, acceleration can mean changing speed or changing direction because acceleration is a vector. So I told you that force is the vector. I saw Chris Angel on his magic TV show do what he claimed was a superhuman strength trick. And I said, no, 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 no. That's just good physics. I can do it, and I'm fat, old, and out of shape. So have I convinced you force is a vector? Direction makes a difference. We're going to have to pay attention to that. Again, like we did two units ago, though, we'll keep it simple. We'll let one way be positive and one way be everybody. In fact, we won't even be that. We'll just do probably bigger minus smaller. We won't even go through the plus negative. We'll just go bigger minus smaller like you did in your head with that five take away two. Okay? How does Newton's first law help explain how seatbelts save lives? If the seatbelt wasn't there, what would happen? Yeah. I don't know what that means. Your, your, your head would hit the... Your body would keep going. Your body would keep going in a straight line at a steady speed. In fact, there's a joke from the 1950s and 60s. I grew up before seatbelts were mandatory. What do you yell when you want the front seat? Shotgun. Now, that comes from the old stagecoach days where the driver was handling the reins and next to him was somebody holding a shotgun to make sure everything was okay. Good to see you here. But in the 1960s, we used to, we added something. We said, shotgun, if there's a car accident, I'll be the first one out to inspect the damage. And what we meant by that was if you weren't wearing your seatbelt, you were going to go through the windshield, and on your way over the hood, you'd inspect the damage before you died, right? Why wasn't the driver shotgun? Well, they were, but they were going to get stopped by the steering wheel. They were going to smash the steering wheel. So how does Newton's first law help explain how seatbelts save lives? Seatbelts apply, they, they apply an unbalanced force to bring us to a stop. Very simple invention. Saved countless lives. Okay. Why wouldn't you want a seatbelt on a motorcycle then? Oh, sorry, I scrolled up too far. Why wouldn't just pick up where we are? So, 
Why wouldn't you want a seatbelt on a motorcycle? Have you seen a motorcycle with seatbelts ever? Why not? Oh, and what? You do. You guys are way overcomplicating it. Be obvious. Why wouldn't you want a seatbelt on a motorcycle? Okay, A motorcycle has closer to the same mass as a human, about the same inertia. They're going to tumble at the same rate. We probably don't want you attached to the tumbling wreckage. We would prefer you actually to be removed. Then, because the motorcycle does actually have a little bit more mass usually than the, than the human, you'll spread apart a little bit. Okay, So, being obvious, we don't want to be attached to tumbling wreckage. Is that all right? Next page. So let's look at some examples here. Newton's first law, you don't realize how powerful a tool it is to understand the world around you. You'll find out, especially as you do physics 12, you'll come to appreciate, oh my goodness, I can solve an awful lot. I can figure out an awful lot just by using Newton's first. So Manuel weighs 1,000 Newtons. I gave you the force of gravity, not kilograms, and stands in the middle of a board that weighs 200 Newtons, like this picture. The ends of the boards rest on bathroom scales. Fill in the correct weight reading on each scale. So here we go. Fahim, look at this first picture. I'm going to zoom in a little bit. What's the total force down? How many Newtons are pointing down grand total? Loud and proud. Is Manuel sinking into the ground like quicksand? No. Is he flying into you like Superman? No. Is Manuel accelerating? No. Then the forces must be, I'm looking for a word that starts with letter B. Balanced. What's the total force down? What's the total force up? Same answer. Same answer. Has to be 1,200 Newtons. So how much is each scale pushing up with? Do the math. Yep. Has to be. Has to be. Otherwise, if those forces did not balance out, Manuel could not be at rest. He would have to be accelerating. Okay, now Manuel's going to walk sideways a little bit. So instead of the weight split evenly, but still, we can do this. We can do this. I can handle this. Mallory, what's the total force down? 1,200. So what is the board sinking into the ground like quicksand? No. Is it flying to like Superman? No. Is it accelerating? No. So the forces must be, I'm looking for that starts with letter B. So what must the total force up be? 1,200. How many Newtons is this scale pushing up with? How many Newtons must must this scale be pushing up with? You can use a calculator if you need to. Jada, what do you got? Has to be. If it was 351... It would have to be accelerating up. If it was 349, it would have to be sinking into the ground like quicksand. Has to be. That's the power of Newton's first. Oh, we can even look at, at bridge design. So a 12-ton truck is one quarter of the way across a bridge that weighs 20 tons. A 13-ton force supports the right side. How much is the support force on the left side? I can do this. And I can do this without going cray cray. Ella, in the corner here, what's the total force down in tons? What must the total force, for, oh, first of all, is this bridge sinking into the ground like quicksand? I hope not. Is it flying into there like Superman? I hope not. In fact, I'm pretty sure for a bridge, the forces must be, I'm looking for a word that starts with letter B. So how hard must this bridge support be pushing up with? You said 32? Why must that be incorrect? Ah! Good. Because 13 plus 19, there's my 32 up, 32 down. This will not accelerate.
In terms of Newton's first, the law of inertia, how does a car headrest help to guard against whiplash in a rear-end collision? And you might recall the subway sleeper that you saw as a hint. How does a car headrest rest help guard against whiplash in a rear-end collision? And let's assume you're at rest in your car, so it's like at a stoplight. Somebody rear-ends you. What happens? Your body goes forward. What? Your head would... i got to be fussy. It doesn't go back. It stays at rest. It's your, but you're going to think your head went back because you're thinking through your body. Simple fix, the headrest. And by the way, when you all get your first car that belongs to you that you're driving, first thing, promise me, adjust the headrest. It's such a stupid, simple thing that you can do. It takes five seconds. Adjust it for your height, and you've got it for the rest of the time you own the car. If you ever get rear-ended, you will thank me. You will prevent a whole bunch of pain and injury. Okay? So... How does it, I don't want to write a long explanation, but I love your explanation. Let me think how I can, oh, head would remain at rest. And then I'll do a semicolon, headrest, ironically, prevents the head from being at rest, even though it's called the headrest. Headrest applies force to head to keep it with your body. Simple equipment does a great job. Might mess up your hair a little bit. Live with it. I think I forgot to include this in your notes, but you want to know another nice example of Newton's first? Hovercrafts. So let's bring out my hovercraft, shall we? So you got a chance to ride a hovercraft. Newton's first, you got a chance to experience it, some of you. Starting to see what I mean by... Oh, by the way, Newton's first also explains how everything works in outer space. In outer space, when there's no gravity, you fire your rocket and then turn it off, it'll just keep coasting until the end of the universe. Nothing will stop it. So we got to give Sir Isaac Newton full credit. In 1680, 1690, at a time before hot air balloons were even a thing, he was imagining what outer space would be like. Newton's second is the equation. It's actually the only equation you're going to get for this whole unit, although we'll tweak it. It explains how to calculate force, and it says this, F equals MA. Although force is a vector and acceleration is a vector. Mass is a scalar. F equals what, what? MA. F equals what, what? Everybody? F equals what, what? Everybody? Find it on your green sheet. It's going to be on the front page, I think, just beneath the kinematic stuff about halfway down. So you technically don't need to memorize this. All of you will, because you're going to get sick of looking it up, and it's a pretty easy one to remember. Oh, by the way, F equals MA. Get the A by itself, please. Oh, get the M by itself, please. We can do all that. Oh, this also means that technically one Newton is one kilogram meter per second squared. Because if force is mass times acceleration, it's got to be kilograms times meters per second squared. And in fact, for a while, that's what we called force. We said it was measured in kilogram meters per second squared, but then we decided to rename that a Newton to shorten it and also to give him some credit. Malcolm has a mass of 65 kilograms. What's the magnitude of the gravitational force acting upon him? Ooh. Okay. Scott, what's this asking me to find? The magnitude of the what? Force, you say. Well, F equals what, what? Now, oh, my abrev for gravitational force, Scott, is I put a little G as a subscript. That's the force of gravity. Hey, Scott, what's the mass in this question? What's the acceleration due to gravity? You probably don't even need to look it up. You probably still have it memorized. No, no, no. Uh, it said magnitude, so we'll ignore the negative. How many newtons of force is gravity exerting? 
I can do this in my head. It's going to be 650 take away, thir uh, take away 13. Uh, 637? Double check me. Yeah? Little note. Gravitational force has a special name. We call gravitational force weight. Weight is not measured in kilograms. It's measured in newtons. And I will be fussy on that. If I tell you to find an object's weight and you tell me 65 kilograms, nah. -uh. But we'll pound that into your brain later on this evening. Malcolm stands on a table. Scott, Malcolm's not here. Scott, stand on the table, please. Okay. Y'all look at Scott. What's the force acting on him? What did we just say? Starts with letter G. How big? Let's pretend it's Malcolm. How big? How many Newtons exactly? <clears throat> How many Newtons exactly? We just calculated it. Now, but look at him. Is he sinking into the ground like quicksand? Is he flying into you like Superman? That means the forces have to be, I'm looking for a word that starts with letter B. So if gravity is pulling down on him with 637 newtons, how hard must the table be pushing up on him through his feet? Exactly. Has to be. I didn't say get down. Get back. Okay. How do we know? And this is kind of weird. You're not, again, used to an inanimate object applying a force. How do we know the table must be applying a force? If it wasn't, he'd be in free fall going down. That's what I felt when I jumped out of an airplane. Eventually, I jumped out of an airplane. That's what I felt when I jumped out of an airplane. In free fall, I felt the felt force of gravity, no ground pushing back up on me. Right now, through his feet, Scott can feel the ground pushing up on him. In fact, Scott, can you do me a favor? Stand on one foot. Can you feel now all of, all of that force is going through one leg and you can feel it. That 637 newtons now stand on two feet, Scott. Now the 637 is being spread through both your legs on one foot. Now it's on one foot, on one foot. All, now it's all coming through one leg. You feel somehow like you got heavier. It's not. It's just that all that force is being channeled through one leg now, not being split evenly among two. Yes, you can. I was going to see how long I could keep you up there before you asked. I was going to see if you would stay up there until the end of class. So how do we know this force exists? How do we know there had to be a force pushing up? What was that? He wasn't accelerating. So the forces must be balanced. So you could say this. Uh, you know what? A equals zero, so forces are balanced. In fact, I said represent Malcolm with a dot. If you do this, you have 637 newtons down. You have to have 637 newtons up. Otherwise, how the heck could he not be accelerating? If for answer, if I had asked you this question and Mallory, for your answer for part two, instead of saying A equals zero, so forces are balanced, if you had simply said Newton's first, I would accept that. This is why I said you don't need to memorize which rule is which rule is which rule. But if you do, you can use that as one of your answers and save yourself some writing. By the way, we call a diagram like this where I represent the mass with a dot, we call it a free body diagram. And if DFIC was the best tool I gave you two units ago, the best tool I'm going to give you this unit is a free body diagram. In fact, often you're going to hear me say, this is a job for a free body diagram. We'll pause here.